St. Andrews has brought me nearer to Jesus and continues to in new ways every day. We are invited into following Jesus on the way of life. I feel like I'm at home when I'm here, and my relationship with the Lord has just begun. I didn't have one until I came here, and I'm so thankful. I really see the heart of Jesus in this community, and it's just like one beautiful, multi-generational family. That's what the entire Bible is about, You're receiving the goodness of God and His mercy and grace and forgiveness, and that being the catalyst and the power to step on the journey of following Him following Jesus. God put that in us, a natural desire to serve, serve Him, serve others, and that's what we're doing here. Well, welcome once again to uh, Mother's Day weekend. It's pretty special. We have one more gift for you kind of to celebrate the day, and it may be my favorite. It's well, here's what we did. We invited some of our children to draw a picture of mom. Have a look at the screen. This is my mom. This is my mom and I love her. This is my mom, and um, I drew this yellow orange dress because uh, she likes orange. I'm mommy's name and I made this and like the smell of my name. I put her clothes with purple because she always like likes purple and she always dresses really good. My favorite thing about my mom is that she takes care of me. That she helps us wake up early to go to the early school. And she is very, very nice. That she takes uh, my dog out and makes so she doesn't start howling and barking. She's nice and kind, and she's helpful, and she makes dinner. What's your favorite thing about mom? Um, she makes dinner. What kind of dinner she makes? Um, green pot stuff. Green? Yeah. Naughty. Probably. Taco Tuesday. Uh, tacos. Mmm. Her food. Pizza. She's really kind and she makes. And she's always caring. She takes care of me and my brother. Mm. Is very, very nice to me. Uh, my mom's very organized and I hope I'll be organized when I'm older. Because she's nice. She's nice. I hope I'm as kind as her and care about my children as she cares about me. I love you, Mommy. I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. Love you, Mommy. Draw a picture of your mom. No, Daddy. No, Mom. Okay. It's Mother's Day. Um, Mommy. Makes sense. Yeah. It's the right answer. It's the right answer. <laughs> I can't believe that. The last thing I thought I'd hear from that child was green gnocchi. That's a Newport kid right there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> pretty wonderful. Let me ask you to begin with, what image do you draw in your mind when you think about your mom? Go ahead and just in your brain right now. Draw that image for a moment. And by the way, um, this is not going to be a, a, a time where I try and get into the, uh, the emotional mechanics of your family of origin. That's not the issue here. Because here's the situation. The truth is that for many of us, the image that we have of mom and of dad and the image that we hold of God are remarkably similar. And so, when you, when you put those two together, that turns out to be tremendously important to our faith. Writer A.W. Tozer put it this way, he said, the most important thing about you is the image that comes into your mind when you think about God. 
And to that I say, wow. Really, the most important thing about any given person? Tozer is absolutely convinced that's the case. And I've been thinking about that for almost a month now, that, that phrase from his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. And, you know, I think I, I think I would say I believe that's true. The most important thing about you is the image that comes into your mind when you think about God. Because what you and I think about God shapes how we live. It determines pretty much what we care for. It determines how we pray, what we pray. It determines how we receive blessings and crises. The image we have of God, the picture that comes into our mind, it changes everything about us. Let me prove that to you for a moment. If you think God is disengaged from you, if He is the, the watchmaker of Thomas Jefferson and so many others, the kind of deistic watchmaker who made the universe and then sets it aside, and He is separate from you right now, then you will probably be disengaged with God. If you think that God is, as so many people kind of in our prayer life seem to default to, if you think God is some kind of cosmic vending machine that all you really need to do is put in a prayer or put in a little bit of good works or something like that, and God is required then, if you pull the right trick, to, to bring out a blessing for you. If that's what you think God is primarily in your brain, then you're probably only going to pray to God when you need something. If you think God is critical of you, then you're probably going to resist Him. And so, study after study bears this out, that our image of God changes us, but not only that, that our childhood impressions of our parents become our first views of the one who is called our Heavenly Father. And some of you right now are saying, uh-oh. And you're saying it for two reasons. You're saying it, one, because you're a parent maybe, or you're planning to become one, and you're like, I am not the heavenly parent that my kid will need. Or number two, uh-oh, because I didn't have parents that treated me so heavenly when I was growing up. Well, the good news for you and for me in all those situations is that we're not stuck with those pictures of God that we have from our childhood, those stick figures of God. They're simply the beginnings. Those childhood drawings can be reshaped. They can be sculpted into something more three-dimensional and more specific. They can become paintings and masterpieces of the beauty of God Himself. A God who is loving and kind and king of the universe and the forgiver of sins and the saver of our souls. How do you do that? Or let's start with the basics. Have you done that? Have I? One of the things we can do is fill our minds with those pictures of God that are more fully formed. And I can't think of a better one than the psalm we're going to look at today. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to look at Psalm 139. And we'll read from the first to the 18th verse. And I invite you right now to stand in honor of God's Word if you have that ability. <clears throat> and if you don't have a Bible in front of you, actually, maybe more the better in some ways because let these words, let the poetry of them, let the imagery of them just wash over you and hear this as if for the first time. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. 
Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I want you to take a moment with me and just hear three very wonderful, significant, but at the same time simple messages. The passage we just read, 18 verses, really divides itself into three sections. It's so very clear. It's, frankly, it's one of the easier times in Scripture where you can say something like that. So the first six verses really describe this, I'll put it in this simple way, God knows me in every way. The psalmist begins, you've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from the far. The word to know or some synonym of that word is listed in these verses seven times. God knows me. He knows me. He knows me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. He discerns me. He perceives my thoughts from afar seven times. And if, if you kind of make your way through the Bible very often, you find that that number seven has some meaning to it. It's really the Bible's number to describe completeness or fullness or perfection. God knows me fully. I mean, seven times, seven days God created the earth. When Jesus spoke to the churches in Revelation, He spoke to seven churches. Over and over again, the number seven does that. God knows me perfectly, fully, completely. Larry Crabb, the writer and counselor from Colorado, had his world come crashing down to him when he was diagnosed with cancer. And he wrote about it afterwards, and he noticed that people, no one really wanted to know about his illness. Oh, people wanted to come and visit. They wanted to help. They, wanted to be, they were willing to pray, but nobody pulled up a chair and said, tell me what it feels like to have cancer. Does it hurt? What are you feeling today? And so Crab puts it this way. He says, you know, as I was going through this, everyone around me wanted to help, but no one wanted to know. And I know about you, but when I think about my own prayers sometimes, and when I hear the prayers of others sometimes, I think that I'm speaking to, we're speaking to a God who, who may want to help, but really doesn't care to know about what we're going through, which is odd to me because the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from the whole spread of it, tells a story of God 
who consistently wants to know you and me, know everything about us. And God, when He wanted to rescue us, did not simply send a lecture to us. He did not simply come and speak to us. He walked beside us. And His last promise to us and to His disciples was that He would be with us to the end of the age. God wants to be beside us. He wants to slip His hand into ours, or better yet, have us slip our hands into His and to walk beside Him, knowing it's going to be a good and wonderful future simply because He is in it with us. He knows us. You know, a lot of people need to remember God has never faltered in His passionate desire to be with you. From the throne of heaven to a cross in Calvary to the next problem you and I have, He knows you. God knows me in every way, but not only that, God is with me always. Beginning with verse 7, the psalmist here pulls out his smartphone and says, okay, hold on, let me tap the GPS app and where can I go to get away from God? Let's see. If I go to the heavens, no, he's there. How about uh, the depths, uh, the, the, the grave, Sheol as it's called in the Hebrew? No, he's there as well. Um, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, that's a beautiful way of describing the dawn comes from the east, okay? If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I go as far east as I possibly can, nope, nope, he's still there. How about the other direction? If I go to the far side of the sea, again, think about where the psalmist and all the writers of the Bible lived in this portion of modern-day Israel-Palestine area. The Mediterranean Ocean is the only thing that's west, so all the way past the sea, even there, your hand will lead me, your right hand will hold me fast. And then he goes, I've got it, darkness. I'll go to the darkness and let the night become dark around me. Nobody can see a thing there, right? No. Even there. Because the darkness is not dark to Almighty God. It shines like the light. You know, some people have, have, have that question, you know, how can I look for God? Or I, I've been looking for God, I'm a seeker, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find God. A couple years ago, the, the uh, kind of the fashionable Christian bumper sticker was a cross with some rays of light coming out from it, and then this wonderful thing that just said the word, I found it. And I think to myself, it wasn't a Presbyterian behind the wheel. I'm sorry, I just don't believe that, because here's what we have as we look at Scripture. We don't find God. God finds us. He pursues us. C.S. Lewis says that our search for God, let me get, our efforts in seeking after God are about as ridiculous as the mouse seeking after the cat. God keeps looking for us. Do you want to find God? Are you seeking God? Well, start with the understanding, start with the belief, start with the truth that you may not have in your soul, but is certainly there in all of God's creation and all of Scripture, that your desire to find God cannot compare with God's passionate desire and His effort to find you. And that's what we begin with. God knows me in every way. He's with me always. He finds me. He's, I, I, I can't leave Him. Somebody said to me a little bit ago that uh, he asked his mother once, 
Mom, is it hard to get into heaven? And she says, no, it's hard to stay out of heaven. God keeps running after you all your life. To resist Him for your whole life is difficult. (laughs) I love that. God seeks after us. Now, there still is a decision that we need to make, and I pray that we make it. And it's a decision that happens every day. God, I submit to your pursuit. Take over my life. Here's my white flag of surrender. I'm yours. If you never made that commitment, if you never said that, it's really almost that simple. Just tell someone else, tell someone who's been a follower of Jesus for a long time and let them guide you and pray with you. But that's really what you and I are called to do. Beginning with verse 13, the message shifts again. And I'm going to sum up that that passage by saying this. I think 13 to 18 says, God thinks I'm wonderful. Let me prove it to you. For you created me, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I love the idea of God just knitting a pair of socks, but they're not socks, they're you. And I don't know about you, but maybe you remember your mother. I remember my grandmother knitting and my other grandmother crocheting. I never realized how they were different, and I'm still not really clear on it. But you, you do this sort of thing, and when you're finished, you go, I made this. And I got to tell you, that makes it more special, doesn't it? And you hold on to that. And in the Eckelman home, there's some things that are really out of fashion with everything else that's around them in the Eckelman home because they've been crocheted or made or knitted by a dear family member, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. I knit you together. And then the psalmist says, and I wonder if you and I can say this, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. All of us with body images and and who struggle with how we are and what talents we have and things like that, I wonder if we can say that from the tips of our toes to the top of our head. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And by the way, God, you made me. God thinks you're wonderful. He thinks I'm wonderful. And if anyone ever asks God, would you draw a picture of your child? He gets a big smile on his face as he draws it and said, she's special. He's special. Do you feel that? You know, this last year, 2020 was, I call it our blind date with the devil. It was, uh, it was quite, a, quite a year, wasn't it? It was also for me the first year that Mother's Day came around where I couldn't give my mom a call. I was just grateful she got spared that because my mother was the most social person I know and she would not have tolerated COVID. Pandemic, spandemic, she would have said. Some of you got to know my mom. Barbara Eckelman was, <laughs> she never met a person she didn't want to feed. That's pretty much it. And from Swedish extraction, and for that reason, her love for you was shown in the number of grams of saturated fat in the thing that she fed you. Here, there's, there's butter in this. You're going to love it. You know, that sort of thing. Over and over again. Have some more eggs. You know, just cheese and everything like that. And oh, my heavens. So, you know what? When I think about my image of God, I think my mother helps me there in some ways. Because when I think of God, I have no problem believing that God gives me things, that He's generous with me, that He feeds me, that He provides for me. 
And yet, on the other hand, and I'm not asking you to get too deep into the, uh, into the family dysfunctions of the Eckelman family of origin. Let me just say this, though. I have a tougher time believing that God still loves me after I disappoint Him. I have a tougher time believing that God doesn't smile at me for that one moment when I fail Him and then turn around and go, could have done better. I have a tougher time believing that God isn't a little passive-aggressive about that, not because He means to, but because that's just the way things should work, isn't it? I have a tough time believing that God in His perfection somehow loves somebody as imperfect as me and is proud of me. And maybe that's you as well. You know, we often ask, what do you believe about God? But there's a more important question there. What does God believe about you? And that's what these passages say, the, the verses 13 through 18, say what God believes about you and me, how much He loves you, how much He cares about you, how much He's proud of you because He made you. And then, and I, I, I got to take this one thing, we've been talking in sections of this psalm, but Let's put up this last verse, which is just absolutely wonderful. When I awake, I am still with you. You ever thought of a God who actually is there the moment your eyes open up, before your feet even hit the floor? A couple weeks ago, Timberly and I, it's like we had a stopwatch and we went, two weeks after the last vaccine, go now. Let's go see the granddaughter. Had to. She's four years old. I haven't seen her in a year and a half except on the flatness of a video screen. And so we left and Timberly says, when are we going to go? I said, Sunday night, right after I get to preach or teach or whatever it is. And we left the, the last flight of the evening and we got there late and, and it's in Texas, and so the next morning, uh, our granddaughter, mom and dad have an alarm clock for her. It doesn't make a noise, but it shines a green color when she's allowed to wake up. And she gets up at 7.09, okay? Which, by the way, is 5.09 for us coming from California. And so 7.10 rolls around, and I roll over. Hi, Gampa! Right there. I mean, she's just waiting for me. And I jump. And in jumping, I kind of tap my wife, and my wife jumps. Ah! I got to tell you, it's okay to be starved for sleep for six long days when every single day there's somebody waiting for you to wake up. Isn't that cool? When I'm awake, I'm still with you. Can you imagine how much God loves you that He waits for you to wake up? That He's just there saying, okay, sleep a little longer, but I can't wait for this day. We're going to have a great time because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have been knit together by me, and I think you're wonderful. What's it like for God to believe that? To believe in you so much, to believe that you're worth knowing and worth being with and worth creating and worth saving. That's what God believes. So the big question here, let's get beyond the stick figures of God that we have had most of our lives and let's fill out the picture. God believes that about you and so the big, big question is, what do you believe 
about what God believes? And the answer to that question, well, that might be the most important thing of all. 